Well, this is the River Wye and we've come here to fish for pike and this is one of the most fantastic views of the Wye at Simmons Yap Rock. Now, people come here to watch peregrine falcons nesting and of course for this fabulous view of the river. But we're not actually fishing here, we're fishing a little way downstream and officially called the Biblings. Well, walking on this old bridge is like walking on a trampoline. It's great, isn't it, Nick? <laughs> one time places like this were the exclusive playground of brigadiers and colonels and even blokes like me and Mick can get on here so standards mustn't slip. <laughs> hey speak for yourself mate. Well have you know we've gone up in the world. So pike well the British record actually comes from a reservoir it comes from Langdegfed in Wales a fish of over 46 pounds but we're going to try and catch a really big river pike and the interesting thing is there is no official record for river pike although I'm sure that the history books do record the capture of very large fish and I'm here at the moment at the Natural History Museum in London I've got Nigel Hewlett with me Nigel works for both the Environment Agency and is on the British Rod Court Fish Committee river pike they're really interesting creatures how do you get big river pike what produces them I think it's the same with all pike it's food and somewhere to live but particularly with the river pike and particularly looking at the why it's the size of the food they're eating the size of the prey every time they eat a meal it gives them a lot of energy for not expending much energy to catch it and I think that's a key factor with river pike and if you look at the history of big river pike two rivers stand out the Hampshire Avon and the Wye. So do you, do you think, Nigel, that on the Wye in particular, the fact that the game anglers are no longer culling the pike, do you think that's a factor? I think certainly the fact fisheries management practices are changing around the country is contributing to the development of pike fisheries. Well, as far as I'm concerned, and Nigel's already mentioned the River Wye, that is the finest pike river in England and Wales. It's a magnificent place, a place with monster pike, yes. A place of mystery, certainly. But, you know, regardless of the size of the fish you catch, there is no finer place to go fishing than the River Wye on a nice, cold October morning. Well, we're by the river now. It's absolutely lovely at the moment. We've got all the autumn leaves on the ground. The trees look outrageous. The river's very low, actually, but it looks really, really nice. And we're going to fish one of the old salmon pools on the river. It's very sort of steady, fairly deep, dark water, and it looks pikey. And we're going to float fish. Most of the time when I'm fishing on the river, I fish for pike with floats. I just find it's the best way, really. My favourite floats fishing on the river, believe it or not, are these cheap polystyrene sea floats. They cost next to nothing. And even at dusk, when the light's really low, you can see these floats right across the river, right until the last trickle of light. And of course, that is a key time to be catching pike. As far as the rest of the setup's concerned, well, it's relatively straightforward. I've got a two foot long wire trace, which has got a pair of size six trebles on it. This is an egg sinker here. Now, this basically is the weight required to either cock the float or nail a dead bait down on the bottom. And it's an interchangeable weight, so without detackling, you can take this sinker off and put a different weight on. So it's a really good system. These are interesting. It's the small things that often make a difference in fishing. I use these very bright fluorescent beads when I'm pike fishing because when I've cast out and the bait's dropping through the water, I like to be able to see when my float hits the stop knot on the line. If I'm way, way over depth, it'll take a long time for that float to slide up to that stop knot. And I'm normally looking to be a controlled amount over depth. So I like to see the bead hit the stop knot. It helps me gauge whether I need to adjust the depth or not. So too is the line. Now this isn't ordinary line, this is braided line. This braid is beautiful because you can see it and you can just pick it off the water with it being floating. So fluorescent yellow really helps you present your floated bait properly. And then, again, on the subject of visibility, I mentioned that I like to see the bead hit the stop knot. I make my stop knots out of pole elastic, which is quite a bright fluorescent colour. I can see the bead slide up against it, and I know that my bait's properly set up. And that's it. Bit of an odd hotchpotch of tackle, really, but I think it's one that I've arrived at over a period of years of fishing for pike on rivers, and I feel really good using it. Catch a lot of pike. Talking of which, I think Mick's already beaten me to the swim, so... I think I'll go and join him down river and get a bait out there. Well, it's nice to be back down in the Wye Valley. We found a really nice stretch here. Matt's tackled up behind me. 
I've tackled up in a very similar way to Matt. Few subtle differences, but the main thing is the tackle is really strong because these river pike really pull hard. It might look quite uninteresting from the surface, but across here there's going to be boulders, there's going to be deep gullies, there's going to be banks of streamweed. And these are the places where the pike are lying, waiting in ambush, and they tend to move from one to the other when they're hunting. Now, on the one rod, I've got a bait known as a pollen, and it's a freshwater fish. You don't get them in this country. You tend to get them in Northern Europe and Northern Ireland. Because they come up from deep water, the swim bladders are quite distended and there's a lot of air trapped inside. So as long as you don't pierce the swim bladder, the pollen tends to stand up off the bottom and you need a bit of weight to just pull it down. And of course that gives you a perfect presentation right in the face of the pike. Now on the other rod, I'm gonna use a good old favorite, the old mackerel. Now, pike in reservoirs, lakes, rivers, they just love mackerel, and I'm very, very confident in that. I'm sure if a pike comes across that, it's gonna take it. So, we've got a couple of options of bait. We've got a huge swim to have a go at, and what we're gonna do is just try and cover every inch of it before the light goes. Matt's already in action, I'm gonna join him, and I cannot wait. Right, let's just drop it in the margin and just see how it stands up. There's that for a presentation. It's popped up off the bottom and as the current just starts to move it, it's gonna look like a live fish or perhaps a dying fish. And any pike seeing that, I'm convinced we'll just home in on it. Well, the baits are in position and the weight is on. What a lovely place to sit and wait, eh? Yes, I've got one. <laughs> oh, it doesn't feel a bad one. I've, I've been combing every little bit of the river and I've just tried under that tree where it's a bit quieter, where we haven't been making a noise on the bank and got a bite in a very short time. So if I don't lose it, I can see the bait on its nose. And here it comes now, coming up on the surface now, I think. No, it's not having it. Hey, Matt. I've got one, you know, mate. You got one on? You know, we said we'd try under that tree. Yeah. It went within two or three minutes. Are you all right, mate? Well, I've got a tree in a very awkward place. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Was that on a pollen? On a pollen, yeah. Just popped up off the bottom. Oh, it's a double, all right. Oh, Whoa, ah. yes. They fight hard, these river pike. Yeah, they're strong. It's been as awkward as it can be. You can see it. <laughs> Right, it should come in now, mate. Nice one. Right, we've got the pike. We've just got to get Matt up in here. <laughs> Let me have the pike first, and then I'll get you in a minute. Right, I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> well, that's what we came for. That's a long, lean river pike, and a uh, oh, real powerful fish that was, Matt. But you can see it's not like a reservoir or a gravel pit pike. It's uh, more of an athlete, this one used to fighting out there in the current. Well, that's well into double figures, Matt, and uh, a good start to the trip, eh? Nice fish, mate, well done. I think there's a good spot just down river to return it, Mick. It'd be okay. a lot, lot easier, believe me. Okay. Oh, this is a good place to slip it back, mate. That water's cold. Yeah, actually. it's a beautiful fish, isn't it? Yeah. Look at that camouflage on its back, eh? Perfect, isn't it? Yeah. When it's lying down there among those stones. Yeah. She's swinging her tail now. I'll just hang yeah. on a second longer. Yeah, she's ready. Oh, there there she, she goes. Ooh. In terms of physical difficulty, this is probably some of the hardest pike fishing you're likely to do, and it really is hard here. The river really has the potential to turn up some much, much bigger fish, and certainly a 20 pound is a good possibility. Matt and I, despite the rain and the horrible conditions, we're really fired up now. We're going to give it a good go anyway. Well, I've just leapfrogged upstream of Mick. I've moved up a little bit at a time, just hopping the rods up the bank to cover the water. Come to this cracking pool, but nothing yet. But we have caught a fish at least, and we've established that there are fish in this area, so that's good. The only downside, I think, is the fact it started raining. You can see how gloomy it is, and the forecast for tomorrow is for more heavy rain. 
If it rains too heavily, the river's going to rise quickly. There's going to be a lot of weed coming down the river. It's going to colour, and that's going to kill the pike fishing. So I'm hoping we'll get stable river conditions for the duration of our visit. It's in the lap of the gods, really. Tomorrow's another day. We found an area with pike in. Let's just hope the rain holds off and we get the chance to cover more water. I've got it, Matt. <laughs> I've arrived just in the nick of yeah, time. I'm... This is last knock-ins, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a well-known fact that pike do feed in darkness and... Uh, because the fishing's been difficult, we've stayed right into the blackness, and I've just been twitching this buoyant bait across the swim, and bang, something's had it. it feels a good fish. Probably another double, I think, Matt. He looks all right, actually. Oh, yeah. Here it comes. Try and net it now, if you can, mate. Yeah, Hang on, I'll just turn. Oh, it's powerful. <laughs> it just doesn't want to come in. Go on, my son. I think it must be me. I must have lost my strength. Right, because in this time... It, did. <laughs> it went well, straight in there. That's a bigger well, one, Mick. Yeah, that's a bit of drama anyway. We've always put it on these reeds. Yeah. How's it talked? <laughs> Not too bad. Oh, quite. Just across its oh, gill yeah, rake is a bit. Can you see that Just can you lift that? There. Yep. Right, chuck that over the river. There that's you go, Mick. That's a nice well, pike. That's not a bad pike, is it? No, it's a lovely pike, actually. Well, that's. You're on to that. It's a great end to a, what's been quite a difficult day, really. Well, that is one big fat river pike, and I reckon that's not far off 20 pounds. That's not far out. We'll probably put it on the scales later, but I reckon it's not far off. And, well, uh, it's about 18 odd. I'm one happy man. Can't wait for tomorrow. What about you? No, 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 not when you see fish like that. You know, when we're out filming, we get to some fantastic locations, but I think this is probably the most beautiful place I've ever been to. And do you know what really stands out to me? It's just so quiet here. All I can hear is the ripple of that water behind me. And that's quite rare today. Right, Mick. You might never see me again. <laughs> I might start sliding and not stop. <laughs> Next stop, Monmouth. <laughs> Warms you up climbing up and down these banks, isn't it? Right, I've now got that set at about 18 feet. Well, we've caught some really nice pike on the dead baits, and uh, if you fancy having a go at fishing dead baits yourself, you might not know how to actually put the hooks in. The hook positions are actually quite important. Most of the time, I like to just put one hook right in the wrist of the tail, get it in really firmly so you can get a really good hefty cast and the other one halfway down the flank. And that's it, it's as simple as that. Now the pike, when it picks up the bait, it'll tend to swallow it head first. And now you can see the reason why we've mounted the hooks in that way, because when we strike, the hooks are in the natural position to strike nice and cleanly. That method's fine when you're presenting the bait lying flat on the bottom. But the other method we're using is actually to trot the bait down the swim. Now I made the bait quite differently. I actually do it the other way around. One hook, just in the top of the head, and the next hook just down by the dorsal fin. Now, the reason I do that is that it behaves a lot more naturally in the current instead of being dragged through backwards. So there's two very simple ways of mounting your dead baits, methods I've used for many, many years, and they are very, very effective. Sometimes the bites can be really subtle that you get from these pike, and you've got to be aware for any slight movement or dither on the float. And in that case, it was just a piece of weed drifting through, but you've got to be vigilant. False alarm. What depth have you got there, Mick? Well, I've set a 10 foot, but it's on the bottom. Well, I can't catch anything at the moment. I might as well be fishing in a puddle. Granny's doing all right, though. Long last, I've got a take. Oh, yes. Oh, believe me, that feels good. <laughs> Took it right across the river. Oh, thrown the bait. Gone, me. Oh, man. Just thrown the bait. <laughs> it was just sitting down there waiting for you, but uh, oh well. Do you know why the fish came off? One of the other points of the treble had gone into the flesh of the fish. 
It only happens when you don't want it to, actually. That's right. Well, whatever I've done in a former life... I was just thinking about what you've done in this life, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Right, actually, Mick, you can, you can get down here and walk along the bank. Oh, this swim isn't as good as I thought it was, Matt. I thought it was going to be deeper, but um, you can see it's quite shallow. It might deep enough towards the far side. Yeah, I think I'm going to just try a little bit for... Oh, cry! <laughs> Did you see that, Matt? Matt? I can see it. I was just bringing my bait across the river and something just grabbed it. Oh, yes! <laughs> I think it's only a small pike. It just shows two minutes in the right place. He's worth two hours in the wrong place when you're river piking. Oh, he's probably getting on for double figures, man. Wow. See, he's just nicked on the edge where he just grabbed the bait as I was bringing these across. Oh, I've just got to find some way of lifting this out now. Got it. Oh. It's a bit bigger than I thought, man. <laughs> well, that's what we've come for, a nice big chunky river double. and Getting on for mid-doubles, I would say. But I can't get over the density of these fish. They feel really heavy. Just solid muscle, absolute solid muscle. Try and put it back without drowning myself. Well, that's just ready to go. There's no need to hold it for long. Well, as you've probably noticed, I'm having a, a run of luck, not just today, but in this series. And uh, I think in your lifetime, you tend to fish at your own sort of level and ability and you have some really good days and some really bad ones. And luckily while we're doing this series, I'm having those very few really good days that come once in a lifetime. So I'm just glad I've been able to share it with you. Mick spoke about how he's on a run of good luck at the moment and it's exactly the opposite for me. No matter what I do, it just doesn't seem to go right and I know it's not anything to do with the way I'm fishing because I'm fishing as hard as I ever have and you know when you're fishing well and you know when you're fishing like a plonker and at the moment I'm fishing really really well but I'm just not getting that rub of the green and it's very very frustrating. I've been in this situation before and there's absolutely nothing you can do to get out of it. Whether you just kid yourself that you're fishing well or not I don't know really. Oh, it's, when you're on a run like this, it's so difficult and it, it's so frustrating, it really is. You start to ask yourself, you know, what should I have done, what could I have done different? And quite often the answer is nothing really, you just didn't have to drop your bait in the right place at the right time. I mean, the, the pattern has been, every fish we've had, it's been within, a few, well, five to ten minutes of dropping it has. In, yeah, in a it new has. spot, yeah. Yeah. Keep moving. We've run out of decent bait now, haven't we? You yep. know, we? We've used the good bait and we're on the rubbish now. We've got a couple of hours to go. Yeah. Pouring me rain. We've yep. got rubbish bait and our bait won't pop up either. <laughs> so it's not looking too good, really. I think I might have some interest in this trotted bait. It seems to be moving along anyway. It isn't, it's just the bait, actually. Look at the float go. Oh, look at this fish go. Screw. What a run that was. <laughs> Well, Mick's been telling me to think lucky because I've been a bit depressed over my lack of success. And I have got a run straight away in this lovely new spot. And this fish is fighting like crazy. No wonder they come off sometimes. They're so strong, these white pike. We're fishing at the edge of one of the old salmon groins that was put in to create a lie behind which the salmon can uh, rest up. And it's created a terrific diversion for the pike. Do you want to net it, Matt, or uh, you're going to I can it? probably chin it out, actually, if you okay. grab me, Rod. OK, mate. Because the hooks are just on the edge of his mouth. He'll snarl okay. the net up. Yeah, I'll go. Because the bait sticking out of his mouth there. There, yeah, gotcha. Look at that. Aren't they, they lovely, lovely fish? fish. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, they're God. superb. You know, I'm so happy about <laughs> catching that fish. <laughs> I told you, think lucky and you'll be you'll lucky. You'll be lucky. Yeah, works for me. That's a beaut. <laughs> 
really thick across the back. Do you know, Mikhail, look how it's turned since we switched to shallower water, you know? Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. come out of the deeps. It's only about four or five foot deep here. Yeah, they obviously haven't gone into the winter quarters yet. No. It's quite heavy, actually. Yeah, it's probably heavier than it looks, but uh, we won't bother weighing it. It's one's getting back in the water, really, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh. Right, let's get the old freshwater croc ready to go. That ah, fish really wants to swim off, but look at that. Those colours on its back, it gives it perfect camouflage with those rocks, so it can lie down there on the bottom, and the prey fish that are coming past won't even see the fish, and it just lunges up. The prey fish are history. Look at that. Good. another five minutes here and work down to the next swim. I've just walked down actually and it does deepen off a little bit down there. Yeah. Well, Matt, I now think we're totally out of our minds. What are we doing here? I don't know. <laughs> it's pouring me rain yeah. and of course the river's now going to rise yeah. and uh, we fished it in the worst conditions, I think, Mick. Yeah. Low, clear river, yeah. right at the end of a long, hot summer. Yeah. Sounds like excuse making, but on the positive side, although we didn't get the monster, yeah. what pike they were that yeah. we caught. I mean, we did show you a sample of what this river can provide. And what fish they were, the ones we caught. Yeah, really muscular pike, weren't they? We didn't get the big one, but I think we'll perhaps come back for that later. Well, I think that the wise got it all. Pike well into double figures, that's the average size. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely spectacular scenery. This is probably the premier river pike fisher in the country for me. And I'm really looking forward to coming back here when there's a bit of frost on the ground yeah. and the old current yeah. buns out. I reckon yeah. then we might do some damage. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too, mate. Let's go home. I reckon for what we want, it could be absolutely awesome. This is a great swim. Just check this out. Oh, it's a real arm check. Cheers, mate. Well, this is Horseshoe Lake in Lechlade, Gloucestershire. It's really one of my favourite fishing venues. And as far as big fish venues go, I reckon, Mick, this is probably one of the best in the country. Yeah, it's got a great reputation, hasn't it? Well, you've got big carp here. It's famous for its carp. But what it's also got, it's got tench knocking the British record. Yeah. It's done fished over 12 pounds spawned out. Yeah. It's done rud to over three pounds. Yeah. Shaking the British record. Yeah. I think there's so, some big bream here as well, isn't there? Yeah, big bream as well, fish, fished over 14 pounds. If you look at this swim, I reckon this is ideal. We've got quite a lot of weed in close. Yeah, I think we're going to have to rake it, man. I mean, to guide them through, we need a couple of channels, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Most people come here, they fish with a couple of rods on alarms for carp, sometimes for tench. But we're going to do it differently. We're going to float fish as much as we can for everything. Um, some from this swim, maybe some stalking around later. Tell you what, why don't you get the rake yeah. and uh, I'll start unloading a bit of kit. Okay, right, so I'll, I'll put my chest weight on. Looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. We get all the hard jobs, don't we, mate? We do. Well, while you rake out, I'll mix a bit of ground bait up out of that. I say, you're making rather a lot of disturbance there, aren't you? So, Tench, well, the record currently stands at 15 pounds three ounces, a mysterious fish actually caught by Mr D Ward from a gravel pit. Interesting that. Well, we're here at the Natural History Museum in London. I've got with me Nigel Hewlett from the Environment Agency. Nigel's also on the British Rod Court Fish Committee. I mentioned gravel pits. They're fantastic environments for big fish, aren't they? Oh, absolutely, Matt. I think the development of gravel pits, particularly in England, has given anglers so much more opportunity to catch big fish. And the reason why they're special is they tend to be quite deep, they tend to be fairly new, so they're very productive, get lots of weed growth, lots of opportunity for food to develop for the fish. But at the same time, because of their depth and temperatures, they're not always the best place for spawning. So because of that, you tend to have less competition for the food. And less competition and lots of food means big fish. So if you're looking to catch a record, you could do worse than head for a gravel pit. That's exactly what me and Mick Brown are going to do. We're off to Horseshoe Lake, not just to fish for tench, but anything else that grows big in there as well.
Well, this is about as near as I'm ever going to get to gardening, and that's raking out a swim for tench. Doing it for two reasons. The obvious one is to remove this massive weed so we can actually fish, but the other reason is to stir the bottom up and encourage the tench to feed. And you're bringing in all sorts in this weed. There's shrimp, snails, snail eggs. You even get the odd swan mussel. I've got a nice one here. That's, that one's still alive, the shell's closed, but what we really want to do is put them straight back. I think they're quite a rare, rare thing nowadays, and we tend to throw them back into deep water. Anyway, that swim's pretty well cleared now. You might want to have a look at the rake. We call it a rake because in the old days we actually used to use a garden rake. We used to just cut the handle off. But we found it was too light and it wasn't getting down and clearing the swim. So most serious tench anglers make their own nowadays. Something really substantial, solid welded construction. Probably weighing eight, maybe even ten pounds. Something that's really going to get down and rip the weed off the bottom. This is one I've knocked up myself. Really good one this. This should last for years. Behind my float, some bubbles coming up. Well, there are tension in the area, so yeah. you never know. Oh, you've got fizzing now. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, now I've got a duck in my swim. Look at that. Ooh. Beautiful fish, though, aren't they? Yeah. Classic rud. Look at the colours on them. Perfect. They're beautiful little things, but uh, they're about four pounds smaller than what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've only been here for about half an hour fishing and we've already found a problem that we hadn't reckoned with, and that is that this bay is so full of small fish, just literally can't get a bait through them. So even when I get a bait down on the deck, I can't see my float because the fish are attacking it. So I think what I'm gonna do, Mick's gonna persevere here, I'm gonna wind in and I'm gonna go and try and find another area of the lake. I know that the small fish do congregate in this bay, you see, and it's possible that if I can find another spot without the small fish, it gives us a fighting chance of maybe catching the rud. So Mick will persevere here. I think I'm going to take a bit of bait with me and go and walk about and go and have a look. Now, just on the other side of this bay, there's a little gap in the bushes. And um, it's a good spot, actually. You've got to fight your way through the undergrowth to get to it, and you can only just about squeeze one rod in. But sometimes that throws up good tench, so I'm going to go and bait that up. I'm going to throw in some pellets and hemp and just leave it. And then I'm going to go and have a walk around the other side of the lake and see if I can find some bigger roach and rud, maybe just under the surface. There's a spot I know where I might see them, but it's going to be really tough, I think. It's not the right place to go around the back. Well, this is the place just through here and I'm going to throw a load of bait in and hope that it attracts some fish. Oh, it's a tent. Look, it's a little teeny tent. How about that, then? Well, that'll do anyway. I'll just grab this bait. So there it is. We've made a start. We've got the first one. I'm sure there's better to come. This is normally a great spot to actually see the, the roach and the rud if they're here. My biggest asset is my eyes. I'm really good at spotting fish. But there's no visibility in the water today. And when you can't see them, location could be a real problem. Well, there's barely enough room to swing a cat in here. And I'll tell you what, you wouldn't get Mick Brown's wallet in this confined little space. Oh these quite little neglected corners of gravel pits that often produce the goods. Well, that's a real sorry-looking specimen. Looks like a pike's had a bite out of its fin. Well, the old enemies here, these tiny rud, are just destroying every bait that I put in here. I'm sure there are one or two of the fish down there, but I can't get past the rud. Um, maybe I need to come back and try this with some bigger hook baits. Or there's another spot that we could try. I'm not going to give up on this stalking yet. It may well work. It is a good technique. Oh, I've got a fish on now. Oh, it's not very big, actually. <laughs> I thought it was going to be much more solid resistance there. There has been some bubbling in the swim, which persuaded me to persevere. But I think that's the smallest tench I've ever caught at Horseshoe Lake. It's beautiful, that, actually, but not quite the size I was after. And little baby tench like this are quite rare, you know. It's very unusual to see them. 
not making excuses for catching tiddly tent. But they are actually quite rare. I think we'll move on because if there were big tents here, they'd push these little fellas out. And I'll be honest with you, these small rud in this bay are driving me absolutely bananas. <laughs> Let's put this one back. You see, now this fish here, he may well be one day the British record. You never know in a water like this one. Go on, little mate. I've just been for a walk round. There's an area on the other side, and it just looks right to me. I can't tell you why, but it just looks right. And I'm going to go over and fish there. Well, <clears throat> this is the new swim. You know, one of the keys to success on gravel pits, in my opinion, is being prepared to be mobile. And I can think of many, many times where I've gone down fishing for a couple of days on a pit and literally spent the first day just walking around and looking at areas and trying to suss out where the fish are and what they're doing, and then really cleaned up on the second day. So, you know, rather than just put your stuff into the first swim you see and like, fill it with gear and just get static and fixed to the spot. I often find it pays to really adopt the mobile approach, move around, and then when you get on the fish, obviously make hay while the sun shines. Well, I've just switched to a bottom rig and had a lovely sail away bite. And I've got what we're after, look. Now, I knew this swim would come good. I've had a bit of bubbling in front of me, and the float just slid away, and that's a proper tench. Oh, that's a nice fish. Look at that. Absolutely superb. These horseshoe tench are really vivid colours as well. They're absolutely beautiful. Now, that's a proper one. Never mind those little tiddlers Brownie was messing around with. That's a tench, mate. I would think probably Getting on for seven pounds, beautiful. Oh, yes, I'm into one. Yes. Really got them going down there. Right. Absolutely pristine tench. When you think the record is around the 15 pound mark, imagine what sort of fish that must look like. Well, I originally said this one wasn't as big as the first fish, but it's definitely over six pounds. It's deeper than the other fish. Six pounds. Six thirteen. Six twelve. Yeah, six, six twelve. Well done, mate. Yeah. That's good nice, fish on the nice float, fish. isn't it? Lovely fish, yeah. Well, I've got a few fish going now. Just out in front of me at the bottom of that shell. There's another tench. Not as big as the last one, but it's a nice fish. Go now, Brownie. Oh, look at that for a fat one. I think I'm going to put that one on the scales. It, possibly the biggest one we've had so far, I think. Well, there we are. It's just over the seven pound mark. Se at seven, seven, one and a half. We'll call it seven, one. Well, that's the best fish so far. Very pleased with that. This fish is probably, again, six and a half, six and three quarter pounds, something like that. And bear in mind, 20 years ago, if you caught a tench of this size, you'd literally be on the front cover of every fishing newspaper in the country. You're catching a few up there, Matt? Yeah, getting a few, mate, yeah. Yeah, they're coming thick and fast down this end. Well, I've got a lovely fish on now. That was a classic bite. Ooh, that's a beauty. I've never caught tents like these horseshoe fish. They're, they're absolutely superb. You know, we've talked in this show about record fish, and we're referring to the British record, of course, and that's a colossal fish. Not much chance of beating it, really. But, it, you know, if you set your sights on records, there's other records you can consider beating. For example, each lake will have its own record. The British record's getting on for 15 pounds, but the lake record here is about 12 pounds. You know, that's something to go for. But a lot of people, I think they're realistic and they just try and break their own personal records. My record tench is about eight and three quarters, I think. Not a huge fish by national standards, but if I can beat that, I'll be very, very pleased. 
Well, the light's fading fast and I can barely see me float now, but uh, I'm still getting plenty of fish. Whether we're going to get anything near the record, I'm not sure, but um, I think as long as we keep catching, we're in with a chance. Lovely end to the day, eh? Well, I think we've done pretty well so far. The tench fishing's been absolutely fantastic, and Mick is so addicted to it, I just can't stop him float fishing. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that we should try for the rud. The rud is the longest standing record on the British record books. The record rud was caught in 1932, and it's a fish that's becoming rarer and rarer as time goes by. Now, there are some very big rud here in Horseshoe Lake, and I feel in our quest for catching really big fish, um, a giant rud would just be amazing if we could get one of those. So I'm gonna fish for the rud, Mick's gonna carry on fishing for the tench, and uh, we'll see what happens. I'm into a decent one at last. Do you know how many tench I've had this morning? Since daybreak, I've had seven tench, and this is the honest truth, not one has been over a pound, and I've finally hooked into a proper one. Oh, it, oh it's a good one. Very shallow water, I've got to just bring it over carefully. Get the net under it. Yes. It was worth the wait anyway. Oh, there, look at that. Oh, that's a proper tench for you. Look at that. With all this talk about catching records, I don't think we should underestimate what we're doing here. We're catching some really exceptionally good fish. Most anglers would be very, very pleased with a tench like that. I certainly am. Now, I don't know whether you can see this, but out here in front of me, there's a big weed bed extending a crescent shape. And just beyond it, there's a few carp. Some of them are in the weed, actually. It's not a great surface fishing day, but it's not a bad one either. And I just figured that maybe I'm going to try for a carp. Let's give it a go. Bit shallower there, mate. Now, Matt, the carp in this lake seem to have drifted up to this end where it's very, very quiet and the conditions have changed quite a bit, haven't they? Yeah. Yes, I'm into one, Matt. God, he's taking some line here. I can't stop this fish. Oh, it took about 30, 40 yards of line off so far. I've just stopped it. God, it's come right into the bank. And it feels a real heavy lump. Shouldn't be too thick up there. It'll come through, mate. I've got a big problem here, Matt. Yeah? I've got it out the weed bed, but the weed's caught in the line. Right. And I can't take any more line in. Can you walk backwards and I'll try and free the line from the weed from it? I haven't got a lot of line out, so I might be able to walk it over the net for you. No. Right, you just walk now. Oh, I just can't take any more line in. It's all right. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. Yes. Got it. Nice fish. Oh, thanks, mate. I couldn't have done that on my own, actually. It's, uh, it was a two man job there. Nice fish. Oh, yes, that's a good fish, isn't it? Joint effort. <laughs> Immaculate condition. Well, I brought the I brought the mat with me, so we'll go straight onto that. Oh there yeah, look at that. Oh, that's... It's a twenty matey. A... Well, let's have a quick look in this afternoon sunshine at what we've got. Look at that. What a huge fish. Bit of opportunities fishing. Just dropped into a swim for a couple of hours where we'd worked out they might be. Certainly well over twenty pounds. I tell you what, Matt, that's breaking my arms. I can hardly hold this any longer. And I can't wipe this big smile off my face either. <laughs> oh, that's great fun, wasn't it, eh? Just shows five minutes in the right place is worth spending five days in the wrong place. I can sleep well tonight. Well, we're at the 11th hour now. We've done pretty well, but we haven't caught that big rud. Had the water been clear, I think we'd have had a much better chance because I may have even been able to spot the fish in the water and then actually go and fish that particular area. But I'm fishing a bit blind, and I've come to the conclusion that it's probably best to just pick an area that looks like it might contain rud and play the numbers game, literally wade through the numbers of smaller fish. Now. This is a typical rud, and if you look at the fish, 
it will give you a big clue about how you should fish for it. The most interesting thing is the shape of the mouth. You'll notice that the lower lip juts out way beyond the upper lip. It looks like it's sulking like brownie all the time. Now, that tells you that this fish is designed to feed in the surface layers of the water, and that provides you with a very valuable clue about how to catch them. Now, with the tench, we've been fishing hard on the bottom. With the rud, it's different. You can actually catch them up in the water, so you can fix your float two or three feet deep, even over deep water, and if you keep feeding bait regularly enough, just get a rain of maggots going down through the water, the rud will rise up towards the surface and intercept the bait on the way down. So the stuff that we use for fishing for rud is very, very different to the stuff that we've been using for the tench. You'll notice that I'm using what we call a waggler float. Now, the waggler is fished bottom end only. This float's got a fine tip, we call that an inserted tip, so it's more sensitive to bites. And then down the line, all I've got is one dropper shot, and then the hook itself, a size 14 or 16, baited with two or three maggots. And that's it, really. This is designed to present the bait so it falls slowly through the water, just like the maggots that I'm firing in, and the rud can intercept it at any point. It's very, very effective. The question is whether, by catching a number of rud, I can actually isolate one of the bigger ones and nail one of those. It'd be interesting to see if I can. Here's a fish now. It's not a big one, but... I'm not getting plagued by those tiny little razor blades. Fantastic colours, really deep gold colour of the rud. Beautiful. And I've got a bigger rud now. It's not a monster. This is probably a fish weighing about nine or ten ounces. Classic rud shape. Absolutely beautiful fish. And I caught this on a grain of sweet corn. Now, I'm getting absolutely mullered on the maggots by the small rud. They're racing up to the surface, and I figured maybe there might be one or two bigger ones hanging below, just picking off bait as it falls through the water. There's obviously a group of rud out there, and I'm starting to get bites straight away. This fish is in a different league to anything else I've hooked. I'm sure it it could be a big rud, actually. It's wallowing up near the surface, and I'm petrified of losing it. It certainly looks like a rud. I think it is, and it's an absolutely massive one. Now, I'm going to try and net this quickly, because this could be the fish of the whole series. Oh, look at that. It's a blooming massive rud. Mick, I've got a huge rud here, mate. Good great. Yes, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> oh my God, wait till you see this, mate. I don't Look at that. that. That is enormous. That is the biggest rod I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Absolutely colossal. Crazy. That's up a two pounds, possibly. Oh, it's more than that, mate. You think so? Look how fat it is. Oh. Look, look how fat it is. Oh my God, look at it. <sighs> the rod just arched over. And I thought, I've got a tench. I thought he was playing the tench. And then it just came up on the surface, and I nearly had a heart attack. I'll tell you, my heart is just in my mouth. Have I really caught that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done, mate. These fish are rarer than hen's teeth, aren't they, Mick? Fish of that Ooh. size are. <laughs> I've never seen one that big. Well, I'll tell you what, Let's mate. If we were looking for a really big fish... Put it in, mate. We've got it here. Let's have a look at the scores on the doors. That's 3-2, then. Oh. I told you it was the yes. biggest one I've ever seen. <laughs> God. Now, that is a hell of a fish. Well, I, I've always called Horseshoe Lake the theatre of dreams, and it is. There are so many big fish here of so many different species, and I think we could go filming for a year and not top that. Certainly. That is a fabulous fish. How do we follow that? <laughs> we, we can't, can we? We no. can't. There's only one thing that can follow that. Cup of tea. Yeah, you're right. Let's put this thing back. So, Grayling, well, the record currently stands at four pounds, three ounces. A huge fish caught from the River Froome in Dorset. That's a river that still continues to produce very big fish today. But if you're looking for somewhere where you're guaranteed to catch a decent Grayling, well, you can't go any better than the River Test in Hampshire, a river steeped in Grayling fishing history. And that's exactly where Mick and I headed off to.
Well, here we are. This is the River Test at Timsbury Manor. And we've come here to fish primarily for grayling. And we really couldn't have picked much worse conditions, actually, Mick, because when you think about grayling, you normally think about those lovely frost-covered banks, bright blue skies. It's been blowing a gale, pouring me rain all night. The main river is absolutely storming through. And I actually think, Mick, our best chance of a big grayling is probably to fish one of these small carriers that feed the river yeah. rather than the main river itself because it's absolutely chocolate down there. Yeah, that's our only chance, I think, Mick. Lovely spot, though. It is, yeah. yeah. Let's give it a go anyway, yeah. mate. I've never seen the test like this. It's up, it's coloured, it's choked with rubbish and debris. Thankfully, we've got a little outlet where at least we can still fish. Now, the test is fed by water that comes from the Salisbury Plain, and because it's filtered through chalk, it's very clear. It's got luxuriant weed growth. Because of that, the water's full of invertebrates, underwater insects, and in turn, you've got loads of fish to feed on them. So it's a terrific river, and you've got a whole network of the main river itself and all of the carriers that feed it. It does flow, of course, through some really famous countryside, and there are lots of houses and country estates located along the banks of the test. The river itself's a delight. It's absolutely crammed with fish. And I suppose these days, it really is synonymous with grayling. I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days. The only problem is, I hope the weather perks up a bit, because at the moment, we're going to be restricted to fishing in these carriers and side streams. Having said that, you know, sometimes they can hold a few surprises, so we'll see what happens. You could easily walk past this little pool and think there's nothing in there, but I'm assured that it's full of grayling. The method I'm going to be using is a float. I'm going to use this quite fat-bodied Avon float. On the hook, I've got a couple of maggots on a size 16 hook. But halfway between the float and the bait, I've got my weights. And I put the weights there so that the bait will flutter up in the current and not be dragged along the bottom. I've actually undershotted this float quite a bit because if I shotted it right down to the surface, it would easily be lost in the turbulence. So I've, I've shotted it so it's standing up about half an inch. And usually in this sort of water, the bites don't tend to be very delicate. The fish are fighting the current. They'll shoot out, grab the bait, and I should get quite a vicious bite. Right, I've got another bait on. I'm going to run this down the pool. And I've been feeding it steadily. I'm feeling reasonably confident I'm going to get a bite. Float's going through lovely now. Absolutely lovely. It's a bit of textbook trotting. It's a shame the fish aren't playing ball. Oh, just missed one. Right now, this does feel like a grayling. Well, there's the first bite. Ooh. Oh, no. This fish is fighting rather funny. It's almost as though I've foul hooked it. I think we'd better start to get on this grayling fishing. Dear me. Well, here we go again. Oh, this feels like it might be a better one. This is a real zoo creature, this one. Oh, they don't know I've got out in that current. Whoa. Well, I don't know what's going on here, but I fell hooked this one as well. <laughs> gotcha. Well, that was a good fight. They're a pleasant diversion, these trout. But when you're trying to catch grayling, they do disturb the swim a little bit. But you just have to put up with them and they're out of season, so let's get this back in the water as quickly as possible. I can't believe I fell for two of them. I've got a rainbow trout this time. What I'm really after is a big grey link, and I think I've got one. No, no, it's another trout. Oh, crikey. <laughs> it's absolutely alive with them. Tiny little hook just wedged in the top of his mouth. There he is. I'll put him straight back. Sometimes you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to get a prince. As long as I don't have to kiss Mick Brown, we'll be all right. Well, it's been lovely fishing here. I've caught a few trout, but I'm really not getting among the grayling, so reluctantly, I think I've got to move on. I know that Mick's getting a few fish 
down in the little mini weir pool down there. So maybe I've got to get into more turbulent water. I'm gonna have a little wander downstream and see if I can find some grayling. Oh, I got that one. Oh, it's not a very big one, but I got it. Quite frustrating, these little bites, really. You can't really make a delicate presentation in that turbulent water. Oh, well, that's probably the littlest grayling I've ever seen in my life. Look at that. Obviously a miniature of the real thing. It really is a lovely little fish. It hasn't quite developed the big, impressive dorsal fin that it will as it gets older, but it's certainly on the way there. Right, let's get her carefully back. Right, the best thing is just to toss her out into the fast water. Then she's off. I'll just add one. I hooked it in the belly. Well, it's been a funny old afternoon, really. Caught some big trout. Haven't had any big grayling, unfortunately, but we've got a full day tomorrow. One thing occurred to me, and that was while I was fishing for the grayling, that the colour of the water is absolutely perfect for roach, and there are some good roach here in the test. And I thought, well, why not try for them? I've actually hooked a fish here now, which is great. I've moved across to a different pool, and um, the colour in the water here is absolutely bang on for roach, so you never know, I might catch one. This one, ironically, feels like a grayling. Oh, it's come off. It's a good fish too, that. I'm fishing for roach, and I go and hook a grayling. It's a lovely little pool, this. It's got all sorts of fish in it. Trout, grayling. I'm told a few roach, so never know what you're gonna hook next. And when the river's raging through as it is now, it's nice just to find a little bit of peaceful fishing. Well, I've decided to ledger for the roach. I haven't got much water in front of me, it's very shallow, and uh, I'm only using a very, very light ledger. In fact, it's only a BB shot but it's enough just to hold button there. And I'm getting some bites and I'm starting to hit some fish now. Now the lights fade in, I think we're gonna start getting some roach. I'm sure we are. We seem to have forgotten all about the grinding. <laughs> oh yes, that was a nice bite. A Little bit better this one. Oh, it looks like a roach. It could be a roach, it is a roach, look at this. Ha <laughs> ha, I knew it. Oh, that's great, that. It's nice when you get something right for a change. There you are, a lovely river test roach, look at that. Beautiful fish. Well, it's not quite a pound, it's probably about 12 ounces, this fish, maybe a little bit more. It's a beautiful looking roach though, isn't it? Perfect, classic roach, of course. Silver scales, red fins, wonderful fish, wonderful. Well, he took the bait confidently. You see, that's what happens when you get this coloured water. Roach are very shy biters when the water's low and clear, but when there's colour in the water like this, it's perfect for catching roach, particularly on these chalk streams. That's a lovely fish, that. Brilliant. Let's see if I can get a better one. Well, there's another roach. Not as big as the last one, but a roach nonetheless. And as the light's going quickly now, these fish are coming on the feed. Well, I've really struggled to get a bite here. I put a teeny piece of worm on, something that I'm more used to seeing, and first run down, I got a grayling. There's not many river fish that don't go for a worm. Well, the sport's really fast and furious now. Lovely fish. This is an interesting fish, this is a big dace. Now, this might not look like a specimen fish to you, but it is. It's a fish probably weighing about 10 ounces. The dace record currently is about a pound and a quarter. Now, that makes this a very big fish, believe it or not. Now, that's a lovely fish, come on. Well, I suppose it was inevitable I'd get a trout in the end. <laughs> really pretty colors. Oh, I hate catching trout out of season, they're so slippery and just seems a bit unfair, really.
Well, it's literally <laughs> pretty well dark now, but I'm still fishing and I've hooked something big here. I can't see what it is. It must be a trout. And what the heck's that? It's quite big. Oh, it's still pulling away from me. Well, this was the old one last cast syndrome here. Definitely had to have one. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's a monstrous trout. <laughs> it's a mutant from Mars. Look at this. Really big brown trout, that. Long, lean, fit old fish. Well, that was a good finish. I really enjoyed tonight, actually. Caught loads of fish, nice roach, then a big trout at the end. So it's been a lot of fun, and um, at least the weather got a little bit better. We've got another day tomorrow, and um, whether we can fish the main river or not remains to be seen, because the forecast for tonight is more rain. So we may have to continue on the carriers, but with the fishing in this form, I don't think uh, Mick's going to mind. I know I don't, so we'll see you tomorrow. Well, this morning we've managed to get onto the main river. The colour's dropped out. It's still running quite high, but look at this. First trot of the day, and I've <laughs> latched into a sea trout, which is amazing in January because this is a fish that comes into the river not to feed, but to actually breed. I'm going to get it straight back in the river because we need this one to go up and spawn. There he goes, ready to swim. Well, that's a good start. We've taken a decision today, really, to try and fish the main test. This is the river test. Normally the water is much, much clearer than this. There's quite a lot of colour in the river today, but not nearly as much as there was yesterday when there was a lot of drifting debris. So we're hoping today that we can catch some really nice grayling off the main river. So uh, fingers crossed. Well, I've dropped a little bit further down the run and I've hooked into a grayling here. It's a classic sort of grayling fight. You can feel the fish gyrating and twisting in the current. This one's a male fish. It's got a great big dorsal fin. And that's the main difference between the males and the females. When you see them turn across the current like that, the male's got this huge dorsal fin, which it uses to maximum advantage. It's a beautiful fish. Look at that. Gotcha. Well, that's a nice grayling, that one. Fabulous. Look at that. Fantastic grayling. Beautiful big dorsal fin on it, like a sailfish. Incredible, look at that. Fabulous colours. And they're really, really wiry, even at this size. They're the most difficult fish to hold on to, grayling. Beautiful specimen, that one. Lovely. This is really first class sport. I'm getting a grayling of chuck now and they're almost under my feet. They've moved right up for this feed. You can see that the dorsal fin on the other fish was much larger. So this is a female grayling. Well, I've struck into this one and it's, it feels like I'm on the bottom. Well, it's not the grayling we came for, but uh, it's been a great pleasure to fish it. That's another sea trout, I think. Well, I'm just gonna try a piece of sweet corn on the hook. This one's a good stamp. It's made a right old mess of my hook lip. That's not a bad fish. Another reasonable size grayling. Then it is a typical river test grayling. Back she goes. Well, we just don't seem to have got the bigger fish. I've stuck with the maggots because they're producing the most bites. I've, I've, tried, I've tried worm. There's still a little bit of time left, but the weather's really shutting down on us now, so... We've really got to make the most of these last few minutes and uh, see if we can pull something out of the bag, but <laughs> it's not looking very likely at the moment. This is a better than average one anyway. Look at it running upstream. I've got it beat that thing. Oh, yes, yeah, got it. Got a nice grayling on here. But I'm trying to do him a favour and take the hook out of his mouth, but he just won't keep still. Best behaved grayling so far. <laughs> Ooh. I'm in. Oh, what have we got here? What have we got this time? Oh, it's a grayling, I think. Yeah, it's quite a nice one, actually. Slip the net under this one. Oh, in you go. Oh, well, we're not giving up on this. We're fishing to the last, and 
this could be one of the last fish I get, and it's not a bad grayling, actually. <laughs> In fact, it's probably the best one I've had so far. And just like the others, it's like a bar of soap. Well, I don't know whether it made any difference, but for the last hour or so, I went down to a lighter float and a smaller hook. Still two maggots on the hook, and uh, I had a really positive bite, and I got a better fish. Whether that was the reason, I don't know, but we have certainly ended with a nice one. It's not a two-pounder. It's not probably too far off, but uh, I think we've got to be pleased with that. Considering the weather conditions and the water conditions, we've had a pretty good time here on the test. Caught plenty of fish, and that's a nice one to finish with. So you've watched the series, you might be wondering what happens next? What happens if I go out and I catch a record fish? What have I got to do? Who do I speak to? What procedure do I follow? Well, fortunately, here at the Natural History Museum in London, the answer is at hand. Because this guy here is Oliver Crimmen. He's the fish creator at the Natural History Museum. He's a fish scientist and he's also, by pure coincidence, a member of the British Rod Court Fish Committee. So, Oliver, what's the basic procedure for claiming a record fish, first of all? Well, it's a very exciting thing to happen. You don't want to forget to get the details right at the time. You've caught the, the big fish. You need to have that capture witnessed. You need to have the fish accurately weighed. And you need to contact the British Record Fish Committee. And you want to have good photographs if you're going to return the fish to the river. Mm. We don't like to kill fish. But there is a problem where identifications can be doubtful. What are the sort of details are you looking at? Is it things like number of scales along the lateral line? And That's very important. Um, if the fish's fins are held up so that we can see the number of spines and rays in the fins, that's important. But certainly a good lateral view, a view from the side which includes the whole fish. So you're looking for detail. Yes. But of course, then there are going to be those occasions when it's not clear-cut, aren't there? Unfortunately, if there is a case where the evidence isn't tight enough for us, for us to make a, a confident identification, then we can't ratify the record. OK, so it's a fairly straightforward process. The more detail that you can give, the better. Remember to take good close-up photographs as well, anything that will help these guys in their jobs. I've got to ask you, before I leave here, Oliver, this is an amazing place, actually. Just describe to people, what, what are in these jars around the outside of the room? Well, the museum's collection of fishes spans the whole world and goes back to Captain Cook's fishes, Darwin's fishes, and occasionally a record fish from one of our present angling fraternity. It really is fantastic. Been a great experience coming here to the Natural History Museum, but the most important thing is that if you do catch that fish of a lifetime, you know now what to do. Well, here we are, Michael, drying off very nicely in the Timsbury Manor fishing hut. And it's great in here, actually, yeah, isn't it? It's, it's compared to it's, 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 yes. it's absolutely lashing. It's bucketing. I know, I know. But um, when you look at the weather outside now, which is really wild, wet, windy stuff, you think back to when we started this series, yeah. Cruise and Carp Fishing at Yeovil. Right, yeah. We started in the heat wave, didn't we? And yeah. it was, I think they said it was the hottest day, for, certainly for the year, possibly for the decade. I, I think it was about a decade. Yeah. It was over 100 degrees yeah. and we were fishing it, but we caught. Yeah, it's a Cruise. Yes, gotcha. That's a good crucian carp by anybody's standards. Lovely looking fish, isn't it? Well, this is a proper crucian carp. This is it's certainly the biggest one I've ever caught, biggest one I've ever seen, in fact. I reckon we hooked almost half the crucians in the lake in that yeah. trip. I think, actually, that was probably some of the most challenging fishing. It was very, very delicate fishing. And what about sea trout fishing? Because you'd never done that before. I'd love to see Mick get a fish. So would I. Yeah. Matt! It's the most incredible experience. My first sea trout on the fly. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll see why people do. We've actually had a couple of clonking barbel in yeah. this series, you know. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> oh, that's an absolutely solid specimen. Look at that. Absolutely fantastic. That's exactly £11, which is a personal best for me. And then right at the death, yeah. you had a yeah. clonking great chub. Yeah. £6, 8 ounces. Yeah. I mean, that is a magnificent... Look at it now. Yeah. It's a fantastic fish. Yeah. It's nice... <laughs> what about Affington? Because we went fly fishing there with those great big trout. Well, Sir Michael, you've done it again. 
But I guess for you, the highlight of the series must have been when you caught that carp. That's a big fish, mate. God, look at the size of it. <laughs> look at my face. I mean, that tells that tells you everything, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's put it there. That's a beauty. I mean. That is a monster carp. Yeah, isn't it, it is. My biggest carp is 39 pounds. Well, it's now 44. I'll probably never catch a carp as big as that ever in my life again. But then there was that rud, and arguably it was yeah. the fish of the series. Yeah, I mean, fish. you know, it's all about chasing potential record fish, and you're right. And the longest yeah. standing record on the books, the rud record. Yeah. We got very close to it. Yeah. Very close to it. Yeah. That's three two, that is. Oh. I told you it was the yes. biggest one I've ever seen. <laughs> well and that brings us to the end, really, mate. We're here now, yeah. and you had a blinding series, actually, and you specialised in last-minute fish, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, I mean, luckily, in this series, I've been going through a really good run. Three pounds, one and a half ounces. Yes. <laughs> oh, thanks well done, Sam. Six pounds, eight ounces. Wow. <laughs> Eleven one. <laughs> Four and a half pounds, I should imagine. <laughs> oh, the left. Good team effort there. Good team effort. Fantastic. That's like winning the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Magic moment. Well, it has been a brilliant series. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And um, it's been another great road trip. We set out at the start of this series to really investigate the world of big fish angling and what it took to actually catch some of these record-sized fish. Of course, we didn't catch any records, but we did break several personal bests. And to be honest, Mick, I think it's been a terrific success. We've fished well, we've had some great days, we've had some disappointments as well, but that's what fishing is all about. And personally, I think it's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, once again, Matt, I've enjoyed the experience and I've enjoyed fishing with it. And we're still, we're still having well a great day, mate. It is to the next one. It is to the next one. Cheers, mate. Good fishing, mate.